Hello, everybody. Um, Quote unquote spring is not heard about much, and also why there was a huge campaign to try and put down the popular protests that were calling for change and democracy and freedom. Um, so the you know geopolitical context is very very important when you talk about the human rights situation inside Bahrain. Uh, what's interesting about the island is that a lot of spaces within that upper half is also owned by the ruling family. And what's interesting about Bahrain is that it's one of the islands in the world with almost no public beaches that are accessible to the citizens. Almost all of it is privately owned, whether by the ruling family or people close to them. So just looking at the geography of Bahrain in itself is very interesting and very telling of the political, economical situation of the country. Okay, and now talk a bit about the situation that is developed there and America's role in it. I'm sure. you go. You rip. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so to take you back a little bit, to understand the background of Bahrain, Bahrain actually has had one of the oldest civil rights movements in the region. So since the 1920s, people have been demanding civil rights. Um, and since the 1920s, almost every 10 years, there's been some sort or some form of uprising in the country where people have demanded civil rights, more liberties, more freedoms, more human rights, and so on. Um, and every time the government or regime uh, responds usually in the same way, which is the use of violence to put down these protests. And of course, Bahrain was a British protectorate for quite some time until the 1970s. And in the 1950s, there was an uprising that was actually put down by the help of the British um, during that time. Now, of course, like I said, because it's every 10 years, the last uprising in Bahrain was in the 1990s, uh, where people again rose up demanding the return of the 1973 constitution, which gives them a real constitutional monarchy. But I'm not going to bore you with all of these you know, details about what's happening in Bahrain in the past, so I'll talk a little bit more about what's happening there today. Of course, you all heard about the protests that started in Bahrain, the pro-democracy popular protests, which started on the 14th of February 2011. And this date is very important because it's also Valentine's Day. Um, and the people of Bahrain celebrated it by presenting their love to their country and taking to the streets to demand um, more political rights and a new constitution that actually represents the people of Bahrain. The 2002 constitution was put in unilaterally by the king um, who gave himself more or less absolute power and created a parliament that didn't have monitoring or legislative power. Um, and so people came out demanding reforms. They weren't demanding the, you know, stepping out of the regime. They weren't demanding anything like what we saw in Tunisia and Egypt, but rather reforms and a delivery on the promises that the king had made in 2001 of, you know, the beautiful days that we had yet to live, which nobody really lived. Um, and so, well, let me tell you one thing. Mm -hmm. the royal family is how many people, the rest of the population is how many people? Roughly? I'm not quite sure. Um, the ruling family, according to my knowledge, is there are thousands of them. Um, but of course, there's the ruling elite. And the ruling elite are the people who actually rule the country and have most of the control on the economical and political situation. The population of Bahrain is about 600 to 700,000 people when you're talking about the citizens. So it's very, very tiny. The uh, size of Bahrain is about 3.5 times the size of Washington, D.C., so it's quite small. Um, to add to that, there's a population of migrant workers who are about 51% of the population, so there's about 700,000 migrant workers in Bahrain as well. Um, and of course, the migrant workers are an entire issue in themselves because it's the um, best example of what modern-day slavery looks like, especially in the Gulf countries today. But that's to give you an idea of what the population actually looks like um, in regards to capacity. But that also brings me to my next point, which is why Bahrain, to, to a certain extent, was overlooked. You know, when you're talking about, for example, 100 people killed in Bahrain, but you're talking about thousands killed in other countries, a lot of times people say, well, you know, that's only 100 people, it's not that important. And of course, as a human rights defender, I don't think that comparisons should be made to begin with because every human, uh, every human life matters. And every death is one death too many. But at the same time, also looking at Bahrain from a per capita perspective, um, 100 deaths in Bahrain would equal thousands of deaths, for example, in Egypt, because of the difference in the population number. And so Bahrain, the, cr the crackdown in Bahrain has been one of the worst in what is known today as the Arab Spring. And it also had the largest protests in what is known as the Arab Springs. Almost 50% of the Bahraini population took to the streets to demand change uh, during 2011. And so imagine having about 300 to 400,000 people out on the streets saying, 
we want a new constitution, we want uh, change in freedom and liberties and so on. So this was a massive uprising, popular uprising, where people peacefully demanded change. And of course, like any good oppressive regime does, they responded with violence and people got shot and killed. Now what happened was in March 2011, there was a national strike where almost the entire country came to a standstill because people stopped going to work, they stopped going to universities, to schools and so on. And most people were in the, what was known as the Pearl Square, which is the Bahraini version of the Tahrir Square in Egypt. And so people gathered there and the regime came to a point where they had to make a choice. They either started to initiate real reforms or they had to start a very violent crackdown. And so with the assistance of other Gulf countries, uh, we had something similar in the way it's presented to Libya. We had a foreign military intervention in Bahrain. But it wasn't like the NATO intervention in Libya where they helped the people against the dictator. Rather, on the contrary, the Gulf Cooperation Council forces named the Peninsula Shield mostly in the form of Saudi and UAE troops, the United Arab Emirates, crossed the bridge from Saudi Arabia into Bahrain and helped the regime put down a popular uprising. On that, you can see the bridge there. The, yes, yeah. the bridge that connects Saudi Arabia to Bahrain. And so what happened was a massive widespread crackdown started. Thousands and thousands of people were arrested. Most of them were subjected to systematic torture in the form of psychological, physical, and sexual torture. Uh, thousands of people were sacked from their jobs. Around 6,000 people were sacked from their jobs for participating in protests. Some, in some cases, you know, I had friends who were sacked from their job for liking a picture on Facebook. It was that simple. You had to do something as simple as press, you know, click like on a picture on Facebook to lose your job in Bahrain. Um, but then it also went further than that. They started using uh, very violent means and excessive use of force against peaceful protesters who continued to come out demanding change. And so this very widespread violent crackdown started, and to this date it continues. Since the 14th of February, since March 2011, the protests in Bahrain have not stopped. Almost every single day there are protests in several areas around Bahrain where people continue to take to the streets to demand change, to demand human rights, to demand freedom and dignity. And on a daily basis when people take to the streets to make these demands, the Bahraini government continues to use violent methods and violent means against the protesters. Um, to take it a step further and talk about the international perspective towards the situation in Bahrain. We're looking at a situation where now we're speaking about an ally of the West. This is not a government that the West looks upon unfavorably because there's someone who has a good economical and security relationship with countries like the United States and like the United Kingdom and the EU and so on. And unfortunately, that has been a very bad position for the Bahraini people who have come out to demand change. You know, President Obama came out in 2011 and said, wherever people come out to demand freedom and uh, dignity or democracy, they will find a friend in the United States of America. And the people of Bahrain did that. They did take to the streets and they did demand freedom and democracy. And yet, they did not find a friend in the United States of America. And, and let's be clear, the United States of America is physically right there in the Fifth yes, Fleet. Yes, exactly, in the, in the form of the Fifth Fleet. And not only that, I mean, the people of Bahrain, with all of their demands, with all of their uh, movement, they never were asking for a military intervention. They were not asking for NATO to come in and bomb the regime and free them from the regime. It was basically their only demand was that these countries that say that they hold human rights and freedom and democracy as you know, the cornerstone of their foreign policy, that they actually act upon this. That when they say they support human rights and democracy, then it's everywhere, not just in the countries where there are governments that they don't like. And so people were hoping that that's what they were going to see from the United States of America, as well as the United Kingdom and other countries, that they would do the very least of holding the Bahraini government accountable for the ongoing human rights abuses. And unfortunately, that hasn't been the case. The reason why the situation or the human rights situation in Bahrain continues to deteriorate today is because of the issue of, of impunity, the lack of accountability. And first and foremost, there's a lack of accountability on the local level. When we're talking about Bahrain, we're talking about a country where in 2002 they passed Law 56. Law 56 gave immunity to every person who had been involved in human rights crimes in the 1990s. 
Some of those people are still in government today. And so it makes sense that we're looking at the situation that we're looking at. And the same thing for 2011. The very same people who were involved in the human rights violations are either in the same position or sometimes have been promoted. The head of the national security apparatus, which according to the Bahrain Independent Commission of Inquiry, which the government of Bahrain accepted as being true, uh, was actually promoted from the head of the NSA to being a, a king's advisor at a minister's rank. And so we're looking at a culture of impunity where if you're affiliated with the government, you can get away with just about anything. The few cases that did go to court of police officers who killed protesters, which were very, very few, were of the lowest rank of police officers. And even then, when they were found guilty, they were given up to seven years. Seven years imprisonment for torturing someone to death. Seven years. Whereas we have human rights defenders being sentenced up to life imprisonment on charges of freedom of expression. This is the situation that we have in Bahrain today. And those are the police officers that have been convicted. There are many of those who have been found innocent of crimes of killing or torture and so on. I, I want to bring out a bit. Um, uh, earlier today, you and I were talking, and you mentioned the, the situation of the medical uh, services in Bahrain, mm -hmm. the, the surgeons and so forth. So one of the cases that actually got a lot of international attention was the case of the medical workers. The doctors in Bahrain, you know, they witnessed or were a part of a situation that they never had seen before. You know, basically getting injuries of people, you know, shot with e either live ammunition or tear gas or pellets. They received cases where someone was brought in with half his head missing because he was killed in an execution style manner by a police officer. And so their response was to treat these patients. Their response, part of their Hippocratic oath is to treat anyone that comes into the hospital. And that's what they did. And because they were the first-hand witnesses of the violations of what was happening in Bahrain, because they started to talk about this, and because they refused to stop treating protesters even when the decision came in from the Ministry of Interior that they were no longer allowed to treat protesters that were coming to the hospital, there was a order that ambulances were not allowed to go to the Pearl Square where people were being shot and beaten and killed at some times. Um, they decided to protest against this. And because of this, uh, many of them were arrested, many of them were tortured, and some of them continue to serve prison sentences today inside Bahrain. And so when you're looking at this... You were just, mentioning the surgeon, that there's a desperate lack of surgeons in, in Bahrain right now. Yeah, so Bahrain being as small as it is, um, there are only a few doctors that are specialized within their field. And so, for example, when you're talking about surgeons, there's also only specific amount of surgeons who can do or conduct certain types of injuries or certain types of surgeries. Some of these surgeons today are in prison. And so there's a lack of doctors within the hospital. Um, we actually, the Bahrain Center for Human Rights recently did an entire report on the medical situation inside Bahrain titled The Limited uh, Access to Health and uh, Breach of Medical Neutrality in Bahrain. And we covered all of the different cases of not only the fact that hospitals in Bahrain are militarized and that protesters who get injured cannot go to the hospital. Um, imagine you get shot, even if you're passing by, you're not participating in a protest. You're passing by and you get shot and you're severely injured, you cannot go to a hospital. Because before you can even see a doctor, you will be met by someone from the intelligence services or someone from the NSA or someone from the public prosecution who is going to interrogate you. I met a 17-year-old boy who was shot in the face with a tear gas canister, lost his left eye, and was at the hospital coming in and out of consciousness, and he was being interrogated, not allowed to receive medical attention until he answered the questions of the public prosecution. And so we're looking at a very severe case where people don't even have access to medical facilities. But even further than that, even if you're not a protester, even if you're someone with chronic illness, for example, you have cancer and you need to go to get chemo at the hospital, or you need to go because you're very sick and you need to get a checkup, and you walk into the hospital, there are around 200 different CCTV cameras installed around the hospital. Imagine sitting in an examination room where you need to talk, about the, to talk to the doctor about personal issues, personal health issues, or you need to take off your clothes so he can examine you, and there's a camera up there where you don't know how many people sitting in the Ministry of Interior are watching while you interact with your doctor. This is just, the problem is, is that I can talk for hours about the situation in Bahrain, but this is just scratching the surface of all of the different levels and all of the different situations of breaches of human rights for the people of Bahrain.
I have a few questions. I'm kicking myself right now because you sent me a graphic the other day. Maybe you'll be able to tell people where to find it on the, on the internet. But one of the reasons we get so little of this kind of discussion of what's going on in Bahrain is because the royal family lavishes money on PR firms in the United States. Do you, can you just give a sense of that? I, I don't have a chart. You, you sent it to me. It was a great chart. Um, you can actually find this on the Bahrain Watch website, bahrainwatch.org. And what they've done is they actually did a study of how the Bahraini regime uses PR companies, public relations companies in Europe and the United States to try and better their image internationally. And what's interesting is that in the past two years alone, they have um, employed up to 13 different public relations companies and individuals. Sachi and Knowlton and all the big names are... Uh, yeah, so with Corvus, for example, and so on. And they've gotten up to 13 PR companies just to try and better their image, but also to spread propaganda about what is going on in Bahrain. You know, naming the Bahraini revolution as being, um, you know, schemed or planned by Iran. Because everyone knows as soon as you put Iran in the mix, everyone says, oh, well, we can't, you know, we can't deal with this or we need to be very careful about how we get involved or if we support these protesters and their demands. Um, so that's part of what they've been doing. But then they've also been using this to defame activists inside Bahrain to try and take away from their credibility. And something that I always find funny is I get attacked as a human rights defender and called a spy for Israel and for Iran and for the United States. And I always say that, you know, I must be the smartest person on earth if I can bring these three governments together to pay me at the same time. That being said, a lot of governments out there owe me a lot of money, so they need to pay up. But, you know, this is just part of the PR campaign that the Bahraini government uses to attack human rights defenders and activists. And the defamation campaigns are not something that started with the uprising in Bahrain. It's something that went far beyond that. Since many years ago, human rights defenders in Bahrain are constantly targeted in defamation campaigns and attacks and so on. And this has spread into other Gulf countries as well. This phenomena of attacking human rights defenders because they are at the forefront of documenting human rights abuses and talking to the international community. The difference is when you're talking to a pol politician, you know, it's always a gray area. You can agree or disagree on what the situation should be or what the political outcome should be or the solution should be. But when you're talking about human rights, it's black and white. There is no such thing as justifying human rights violations. There are no excuses for human rights violations. And so for many of these regimes in the Middle East and North Africa region, human rights defenders have become the number one enemy because they are the people who, when they talk about what's going on in, the, in these countries, there's no excuse, there's no justification. And so they get targeted. But what's really sad about the situation of human rights defenders in the Gulf in general, and not just Bahrain, is that internationally they're isolated. When you come out as a human rights defender in places like the UAE or Saudi Arabia or Bahrain or otherwise, you're not only targeted by your own government, you're not only putting your life and your family on the line, but you're also not receiving much international support. Um, you tend to, one of the things, uh, let me put it this way. First of all, how old are you? 25. <laughs> and you are the youngest. I, I want, you don't like to talk about your family, but I do like to talk about your family, so I guess you talk about your family. Um, you are the youngest, and I just to give one example of a family that's doing human rights work and what happens to them in a situation like this. So you are the youngest of, third. the third of four daughters of this fellow here. Yeah. Can you tell us who he is? Well, that's my father, Abdul Hadi Khwaja. He's an internationally known human rights defender. Uh, he actually was the co-founder of the Bahrain Center for Human Rights in 2001 inside Bahrain. Uh, and he went on to work as the regional director for Frontline Defenders, which is based in Ireland. And he covered the entire Middle East and North Africa region, uh, both working and supporting with human rights defenders across the region, but also training people on human rights work and uh, documentation and so on. He, he grew up in Bahrain, left as a student, yes. and eventually settles in Copenhagen. Is that right? Yes. Uh, my family, um, both my father and my mother, were political refugees, because like I said, the struggle in Bahrain is not something that started in 2011, it went far beyond that. And both my parents could not go back to Bahrain uh, because of their, the, their situation, uh, because they had both been active within the movement inside Bahrain. My father was more focused on political prisoners and the case of political prisoners, especially that his younger brother, who's also in prison with him today, um, was in prison at the time. Um, and my mother was someone who was also involved in the activism of, you know, um, coordinating and organizing protests um, a while back before she left Bahrain when she was around 18 or 19 years old. And then when she had to leave Bahrain because of threats 
uh, of arrest and she had not been able to go back after that. And so they both, after having the three of us in Syria, they, we all moved to Denmark where we got political asylum and where we lived as refugees for about 12 years uh, without citizenship. The Bahraini government more or less withdrew the citizenship of most people in exile. So you grew up in Denmark, hence your excellent English. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you speak Danish? Yes, I do. 